everyone. My name is Joy Baker and I'm the Education Manager for the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee. Uh, today we are celebrating World Elephant Day by speaking with one of our international partners. The Elephant Sanctuary collaborates with and supports international organizations on four continents. Africa, Europe, Asia, and South America, with a focus on human elephant conflict, anti-poaching, habitat preservation, research and field work, rescue and rehabilitation, improved management and care in captivity, and veterinary care. Today, I am joined by Joyce Poole of Elephant Voices. Uh, thank you for joining me, Joyce. Thank you, Joy. So nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us virtually. So uh, my first question is, can you just tell us a little bit about Elephant Voices, uh, how it was started, and what work do you do? Yeah, I've been, <clears throat> I've been studying elephants, um, gosh, since 1975. And uh, in the late 1990s, I met my now husband, Peter Gramley. And he said, you know, you really should be getting all this information out there. Let's, you know, let's uh, start an organization and let's have a website where we can, we can share all this information that you've learned. And so together we started Elephant Voices. And I think it became a 501c3 in, in 2008. But earlier than that, we started with a website um, and began putting a lot of this material um, uh, online. And so Elephant Voices really is about studying, you know, the, the voices and behavior of elephants and sharing that knowledge uh, with the world and, and trying to really make um, the world a better place, a kinder place for elephants. I love that. I love that so much. So um, how does your work specifically help elephants in captivity or in the wild? Well, I mean, I think if you, if you, if you think about all that we know about elephants, it really originates in, I'd say mostly the Amboseli Elephant Research Project or the Amboseli Trust for Elephants, of which I was a part for many years. And we have recently um, been back working with the Amboseli Trust for Elephants. So, um, you know, people tend to, I mean, people know elephants live in families, people know elephants care about one another. Uh, many people know that elephants are capable of empathy, just like us. And all of this comes from years and years of research. So, and, and much of that research has been um, ours or we have been involved in that research. So I think that it's really about changing people's hearts and minds. You know, I think sometimes when pe people, people tend to think animals are just animals. Um, um, but when they learn, gosh, that they are able to communicate with one another, that they have thoughts, they have feelings, they, they care about one another, they care about their own lives. Um, um, and whether you know they survive or they don't survive, or whether members of their family survive or, or not. And I think that when people realize that other animals, not just elephants, but other animals um, have these kind of feelings and, and cares for one another, that we too should be more, more caring of them. Absolutely. Uh, so you just launched the Elephant Ethogram, which is a huge project, years in the making. Um, so when did the idea to create the Ethogram come about? <laughs> well, it has a kind of a long history because way back in, um, gosh, the I think it was 1982 is when I was writing my PhD, my, my PhD thesis, and that was on male elephants and the phenomenon of must, you know, this period when they are very ag aggressive and very sexually active. And, and I was the first to describe that in African elephants. No one knew it existed before. So when I was writing out my thesis, I love to draw. And so, and, and so I, I did all these detailed drawings of the different behaviors. You know, must is characterized by um, very specific postures and, and gestures of elephants. So, um, so throughout my thesis are these, these, these detailed drawings. And my PhD supervisor, Robert Hines said to me, 
you know, you really have to uh, go on and, and do an ethogram for, of elephants, you know, describe the whole be behavioral repertoire. And I was like, what, <laughs> you know, how would I do that? But it, it kind of stuck in the back of my mind because, you know, when you're studying um, communication, and especially with an animal that vocalizes it using sounds below the level of human hearing or part of the sound is below the level of human hearing. So you're really having sometimes to strain your ears to catch those soft rumbles. I mean, sometimes they're incredibly powerful, um, but, but oftentimes, you know, you're really having to watch how they're behaving um, in order to catch who was calling because at those very low frequencies, it's hard for us to localize with our, with our ears. So I've learned that elephants, when they vocalize, they hold themselves in a particular way or they flap their ears in a particular way. Um, and of course, sometimes they open their mouths, but not always. So I, I you know, I, I started to realize, gosh, when they're communicating, there, there are these subtle, um, these subtle behaviors that we have to like focus in on. And of course, not just when they're vocalizing. Elephants are, are um, I think we think of them because they're so different from us. Um, we don't often pick up, we're looking for the wrong signs, but you know, with those big ears, they do so many different, different things for them. Hold them like this, hold them like that. Uh, turning the head slightly like this. And all of those signify, you know, different things. Like for instance, you know, elephants have, have great peripheral vision. So just by turning the head like this and flattening the ear against the side of the head, they can see right the way behind them, <laughs> you know? Amazing. So um, yeah, so they can, you know, even though they're not able to turn very quickly, they can, just by doing that, they can say, uh-oh, so-and-so is behind me. Or by holding their trunk in a certain posture, very subtly, uh, they can pick up, you know, who's, who's coming and what they're doing. So, um, so anyway, the long and short of this is that I realized there was a lot up here in my head that I had accumulated from, from, from trying to pick up who was calling and who was doing what to whom, um, and that, you know, people were interested in this. People are interested in knowing, gosh, do elephants say that or can they do that? And so, um, yeah, we decided to try and produce this ethogram. So um, I have to say though, that before back in 2003, we did have two databases online. One was a, what we called the elephant calls database and the other was the elephant gestures database. And those, one was of course about elephant calls and the other was about their postures and gestures. But we just decided to expand that and, and put everything into one place and add video. So um, a few years ago, we were so fortunate and we were involved in a couple of documentary films on elephants and uh, the people we were working with said, okay, we're gonna give you all this raw footage never been done before you know usually documentary film producers are so protective you know because it's all copyright and everything but they said we could use it for science and education so suddenly we had access to uh, all this behavior from Gorongosa where the elephants are, are quite different from Amboseli um, and then we went out with help from Tess actually and collected um, a more more film from from them from Amboseli Plus we had another documentary film material from the Mara. So we had these three populations that we could um, pull all this together. Wow, that's amazing. So you had all of this footage and data. Um, was that the most challenging part of the process going through all of that or was it actually <laughs> interpreting the gestures and, and sounds or was it something else? <sighs> it was a lot. I mean, one was, you know, in creating the, the ethogram, we wanted it to be really user-friendly. So we thought, okay, how, how do we want people to be able to search on this? Because if somebody just comes in, I mean, it's a massive amount. Imagine like, well, how many videos have we got up there? Almost 3000 media files and describing, you know, 500 different behaviors and 
So where would somebody begin? So we wanted to, to build up a kind of a, a search function so that you can go in and it's like, okay, well, what are elephants, how do elephants communicate with their trunks? You know, what kind of, what are the different postures signal to other elephants or, um, you know, with the front foot or with the hind foot? Um, what are the different techniques they use to feed? Uh, so, but how would you find that out if you were just, you know, faced with this, <laughs> this big database? So we, we built it so that you can search, for instance, um, you can go by age, age sex class. So you could choose infants or you could choose must males. Um, uh, okay, what does a must male do with his trunk? for instance, and, and what does that mean? So if you search on these different things, then up come all the behaviors that match those criteria. So that's one way you can search. And you can also search if you happen to know the names of any elephants in Amboseli or Gorongosa. Uh, some of them are quite famous. Uh, you, can, you can go in and, and search in another place just by the name of the elephant or just by behavior. And then all the, the videos that that match that will, will come up. Or you can search by um, alphabetically. So you could click on A and all the behaviors that begin with A. So, so one of it was the functionality of, of the database and, and thinking through, okay, how would, and we were, we were very fortunate that we have, um, we work with a, with a programmer in Kenya so we were able to go back and forth and say, ah, that's not working quite right. Let's do it like this. Um, well, one of, the, one of the things though I found myself because I was the one going through and, and, um, and making all the videos um, was just that there are, you know, each behavior is supposed to be unique. So if you're talking about a periscope trunk it's, you know, we all know the periscope trunk and the elephants hold like that. So um, elephants do this in many different contexts, but as long as the form is the same, then it has the same name. And before it was given different names. So for instance, um, way back in the sixties, <clears throat> um, um, a man named Coombe studied elephants in captivity. And he noticed that elephants do this like two males when they're sort of facing each other off and they're starting to about to spar, they would do this. And he called it a distant frontal attitude. Then I came along and I noticed that elephants do this when they're sniffing, like when they're sniffing, like there's danger somewhere, they'll do this. And I called it a periscope sniff. And then I started thinking, well, okay, what we really should be is any time it's in this, the trunk is like this, we'll call it the same name. Um, uh, but then I realized it's not always sniffing. It's in, you know, it, it actually, we don't know for sure that they're sniffing when we said a periscope sniff. We think now that they may be pointing. They may be saying to others, heads up, there's a problem in that direction. Um, you know, you should all pay attention. Uh, so, so, so part of that was just like, it was kind of mind boggling, like, okay, is this the same as this, or is this subtly different from that? And, and then it's down to lumping and splitting sometimes, and maybe we've oversplit in some places, and maybe we've lumped in other places, but it was that, like, sometimes I would be, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> have I already said this is something else, you know, when you yeah. get up to like 500 behaviors. So that, that for me, that was the, the hardest part. And just, um, maybe I'm going on too much, but <laughs> sometimes, you know, we have behaviors and then those are the individual actions. Um, but then we have also behavioral constellations. So a behavioral constellation might be something like a must walk. So when a male's in must, he has a, a particular strut. And that strut involves head high, chin in, um, shoulders back. No, uh, yeah. there's a very tall and a kind of a really a swagger, right? Yeah. But it involves several different elements, several different behaviors that all together form this 
behavioral constellation that is a must walk. So sometimes people think, okay, wait, is this a behavior or is this a constellation? And so sometimes it would go in as, as one thing and then they say, no, 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 no. This is, yeah. So <laughs> it was kind of a lot of uh, my, mind games trying to sort through all this information. Absolutely. Um, so you touched a little bit on how people can use the database and search the database. I search for a lot of infant videos because those are my favorites. But how do you hope people will use this? Do you hope other researchers will use it? Classrooms, lay people, all of the above? Yeah, all of the above, because although it's meant to be scientific, it is scientific. Um, and, it, and it's primarily meant as kind of a baseline of information about elephants from which other people can, you know, so we're speaking the same language that other scientists are speaking the same language. At the same time, we wanted to use it for storytelling as well, you know, to engage the public. So each video has a very detailed caption. Um, and I tried to write it in a way that while scientific, while factual, it also is engaging. So it tells the story about, you know, the individuals are named and what they were doing before and what I think they, you know, why they were doing, why I thought they were doing what they were doing and, and so on, so. Amazing. So- um, Did I finish answering your No, I think you did, yeah. Hoping that scientists use it, but also yeah. that the layperson can, which I really uh, love. Also, I wanted to say though that uh, some of the people who have used it most so far and used our old databases a lot were actually documentary filmmakers. Oh, yeah. So they, because of course they, before they go out to the field, um, uh, if they're making a film on elephants, they want to learn about, they've got to do their research. You know, what are we focusing on? What behaviors should we be looking for? Let's say if they're doing a film about reproductive behavior or something, then there are all those cues that, you know, it's taken us years to, to, to learn, but now someone can go in and just say, okay, we, that's how you can tell this is an estrus female, for instance. Um, uh, yeah, and then when they come back and they're going through their material, again, okay, what do we have here? I, I didn't realize that we picked this up, you know? Yeah. So how have you seen the ethogram or any of Elephant Voices work have um, an impact on the elephant population? When you say the elephant population, you mean all the elephants? All the elephants in the <laughs> world elephants. or a specific population of elephants. That's your choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it kind of go back goes back a bit to what I was saying in the beginning, which is that, you know, uh, if people understand elephants better um, and know that they care about each other and stuff that people are more interested in, in protecting them. Um, so, you know, that's certainly that has been, has been one of the biggest impacts and, and that's why we work so closely with film crews or people like you. We want to get the message out that these animals are worth saving. Um, that they are so socially complex that we have so much to 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 learn from them and that um they they have a right to be here too you know this yeah. this earth wouldn't function if it was just made up of human beings all fighting for the last scrap you know we we need to figure out how to to make space for the other animals that are part of uh the, the planet's heritage yeah. uh, and elephants require a lot of space, um, yes. really a lot of space. Uh, and that's a challenge, of course, that really is a challenge mm. uh, because us humans are not very good about sharing space. Mm -hmm. And the more there are of us, the more impact we are having on the habitat. Um, you know, I was thinking about how to express this to people, but, you know, we tend to, when we're sitting and, you know, one of the questions you have, I know is about like, or I should back up, I should let you. <laughs> well, no, that does lead into my next question is what do you see as the greatest problem facing elephants? Is it loss of their habitat? 
Is it something else? What, what in your opinion is their biggest threat? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 of course, one, one tends to think of, oh, the ivory trade, and, and of course that has had a terrible impact on, on elephants. But really, if you think long term, um, it is really the loss of habitat, and it's happening so fast. Uh, corridors are disappearing, uh, routes that elephants took between one, one habitat to another or one population to another are, are, are being lost. So populations are, are being fragmented. And, uh, and of course, uh, this is, is having a really devastating effect. I mean, some, many populations are just not going to make it. There's mm -hmm. too much pressure on the land. Um, and some populations will make it, but the more that we can set aside habitat, uh, the more likely more populations will survive. Sure, so then what is something people can do in their everyday life to maybe help with that habitat loss or tackle that problem? Mm -hmm. Um, of course, the easy thing to say is support organizations like ours, like those those many groups that have you know boots on the ground that are got rangers out there protecting elephants, or or organizations that are you know purchasing or leasing habitat. Uh, that's very important. But I I do want to also draw attention to the fact that you know when we when we think about how many there are of us and the kind of impact that we're having on the planet. Um, and you think about elephants and, and you know, there are people like us, I'm sitting in Europe right now, uh, you're in the United States and it's so far away from these habitats. Um, and we tend to think when we think of too many people uh, and their impact, we, we tend to think about the people who live with elephants, that they're the culprits. But I really wanted to draw people's attention to the fact that we here far away are having a big impact and, and give you a couple of examples. Uh, one of them <laughs> comes from a place that's very dear to my heart, which is Amboseli. Uh, and Amboseli is a very you know, small national park and the elephants depend on going outside of the park. Every, every day they go in and out of the park. And that land is being subdivided and a lot of the land is being turned over to farming. And um, the big press right now, uh, right in a corridor that joins the Amboseli uh, National Park with another protected area is an avocado farm. Oh, wow. Okay. And the reason there's an avocado farm is because avocados are all the trend right now. We all love avocados. I love avocados, <laughs> but I'm actually I'm actually being really careful about buying them. Um, not because they're coming from that place, because that place doesn't even have uh, the trees in place yet, and there is a court case, and hopefully they'll be booted out. But but we need to think about the consequences of all our these trends, and you know. The things that we buy, the, you know, we think we just go to the shop and we buy it. We don't think about where it's come from. Another example is roses. So Kenya is one of the, yeah, I think it's the top uh, source of roses. And we all go and buy nice roses for Valentine's Day and stuff. And we, you know, or, or whenever, and we don't think too much about it, but they, it requires enormous supplies of water and pesticides and things and you know one one whole area that used to be part of the greater Amboseli ecosystem uh, the swamp has been totally drained because water was diverted for a rose farm to supply a rose farm among other things mm -hmm. but but it's you know we, we we sit here so far away and think that we're not having an impact every single human being is having an impact far and wide. Uh, so we, we and, and it's hard to find out. It's hard to learn about where things come from. We're not told. So I'm not, you know, I'm not blaming anybody, but I, I think that, um, you know, we need to find a different system. Our leaders need to find a system where people can make sure they're having the 
the least impact possible or you know it's difficult I think that's a, but there are too and, many of us <laughs> I think that's an amazing uh, point and, and thing for our audience to take home is just to to find out where your your things are coming from and, and make better choices yes. I really love that message all right, so my last question is, um, if people want to learn more about Elephant Voices or the Ethogram, where can they find you guys online? Well, we just search for Elephant Voices, one word. Um, so elephantvoices.org is our uh, website, and that's where the Elephant Ethogram is housed. I, I'm sure you can just search on the Elephant Ethogram and you'll find it as well. Um, we're also, of course, all over social media. We, uh, we're on Facebook, Elephant Voices on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, and, you know, some of our, some of these um, posts of ours are really getting some traction. So one of them reached 3.3 or 3.6 million people. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our videos and, uh, you know, I think I wrote it down actually. Where was it? Where did, I, where did I write it? Yeah, it was quite amazing. 140,000 likes. Oh, wow. Uh, 1,300 comments, 10,000 shares. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, that's a great way yeah, to. So join us. Yeah. Join us, please, and <laughs> share, share the posts and learn about elephants. Yeah, absolutely. I always say that's a great free way to support an organization you care about is just sharing their post and sharing their information. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again for joining me on the call today, Joyce. It was so nice speaking with you. Um, for everyone watching at home, if you want to continue your World Elephant Day celebration, you can do so by checking out elephantvoices.org or our website, elephants.com. Um, and keep an eye out on the Elephant Sanctuary's social media channels today. We're going to be highlighting some more of our international partners. Uh, throughout the day, but I will just leave you with a happy World Elephant Day, everyone.